Hello and welcome to this episode of Research in Profile from the School of Politics and International Studies. My name is Dr Ryan Walter and today I'm joined by Professor Stephen Bell and Professor Andrew Hindmore and we'll be talking about their book Masters of the Universe, Slaves of the Market, which casts entirely new light on the global financial crisis. Well, perhaps we could start with one of the book's key arguments, which is that one of the causes of the crisis were the structures that were built by both politicians and banking regulators from at least the 1990s and which were dangerous and then came to crash around the banks in during the global financial crisis. Could you talk us through the main structures and how they came to be and how they came to fall? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ryan. Um, basically, from the 1990s onwards, uh, bankers in the core kind of London and New York markets with politicians uh, revolutionised the banking system. Uh, lots and lots of deregulation, much more intense uh, market pressures, and banks increasingly by the 2000s are under heavy um, profit pressures and were essentially forced to reinvent themselves and move away from traditional um, banking uh, into much more esoteric financial trading activities. So the big commercial banks became much more like investment banks and all piled into much more esoteric um, trading and financial market ac activities, which finally led to um, the kind of toxic asset trading that we know about. And by 2007 and 8, um, the assets, the, the mortgage-based assets on which the um, financial trading was based, were losing value rapidly and the whole edifice of financial trading driven by the banks collapsed in 2008, you know, culminating with the kind of collapse of Lehman Brothers. So I think also, you know, one of the things that we talk about in the book and that we think is important is what the actors, the traders, the bankers believed. So it's a kind of standard view, I guess, that, that goes that a lot of people knew that they were taking a lot of risks. A lot of people were chasing bonuses. A lot of new people knew that they were taking chances, but as long as the markets were good, they felt they'd carry on trading. And actually, when you dig down and you do the interviews and you look at what people were saying and what people were thinking, one of the main arguments in the book is that people believed, genuinely believed, that what they were doing was incredibly safe. Um, they thought that the assets that they were buying and trading had been insured through what's called credit default swaps. They thought that the money markets would always be there to lend them money. And they thought if the worst came to the worst and times turned bad, that the assets that they got on their balance sheet, that they'd be able to sell them. Maybe sell them at a loss, but that they'd be able to sell them and therefore recover their positions. And they had up to a point good reasons to believe this because the financial trading model that was repelled by banks like Lehman's had been working pretty effectively for them for about 10 years. They got through the 2001 crisis post 9-11 and the dot-com crisis without any great shakes. So there was this edif edifice being built up in people's heads, telling them, reassuring them that the markets were actually quite safe. And they just didn't see the possibility that when the markets froze, as they did following the collapse of Lehman Brothers, that they really would freeze, and that the banks wouldn't even be able to sell their assets at any price going at all. There was just suddenly no money floating around the system. The one thing that nobody had thought about, because it seemed simply impossible to imagine, was the thing that brought, brought the banking structures down. And so since the key analysis of the book is based on comparing four countries, two, Australia and Canada, that got off quite lightly, and two, the US and UK that did quite badly, and understanding those differences, how do we understand what, what caused a country to be at risk and what caused a country to be relatively safe in the context of, of the factors you've just discussed? Mm. Well, why don't you talk about the UK and US, Steve, then I'll talk about Australia and well, Canada. Well, as I said before, the US and UK were the crisis hit countries, and they were the ones in which the institutions of banking had essentially gone haywire. Um, generating, as I said, huge competitive pressures, huge pressures for trading in what we now call toxic assets, huge levels of debt in the banking system where the banks were piling on debt to up the volume of trading uh, and eventually the whole thing came um, apart and the crisis of 2008 and beyond ensued. But the core issue, um, we argue, is the structure of banking markets and in particular the level of competition in banking markets that either drives banks essentially off the edge in the end in most cases or leaves banks in a much more stable position where bankers can behave differently and that's the kind of story that Andy will tell you about now. 
Yes, if you look at the UK and the US, you know, they're incredibly competitive cutthroat markets. So the bankers believe that what they're doing is basically safe, but they're nevertheless led to do more and more of it because the banks that are around them and that they're being compared against are racking up ever greater profits each year. So this is kind of competitive arms race in which each of the banks have to keep up with the other one if they're going to maintain their share price and if the traders at the other end of the line are going to keep their bonuses. So what's different with Australia and Canada? I mean, you know, we started this project when um, in Australia and, and it was a really interesting story in 2008 because Australia escapes largely unscathed from the crisis, as does Canada. Gets some collateral damage, so when the world financial markets freeze up, it's suddenly a lot harder for the Australian banks to borrow money overseas and that causes a fair bit of problems. But the banks themselves, their balance sheets in 2008, are in remarkably good um, stable condition. So of the four large Australian banks and the five largest Canadian banks, there's only one of them turns a loss at any point during the financial crisis. Now, given that banks in the UK, like RBS, are losing tens of billions of pounds, that's quite remarkable. So what's different about Australia? That becomes the question that we're really interested in. And up to a point, it's a story of good regulation. Um, APRA, the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, following the HIH insurance crisis in 2001, HIH was a large insurance company that went belly up, and the regulators were blamed for not keeping a close enough eye on it. And APRA learns the lesson. It decides that having been hung out to dry by politicians and commentators for allowing that mistake to occur, that it's going to regulate the banks a lot more carefully. So part of the story is regulation. But in the end, we come to the view that that's only a small part of the story. The key thing about the Australian market, and the thing that it's got in common with the Aus Canadian market as well, is that it's a relatively small number of banks with an incredibly stable market share. Without having to cut each other's throats, without having to get dragged into a competitive arms race, they can actually make exceptionally healthy profits from some pretty traditional, old-fashioned lending activity, whether it's mortgages or business, and they can keep their returns high. Kind of everybody's happy. So as in the UK and the US, the competition between the banks drives down the profits that they're, that they're making on mortgages and business lending. And that's good for the customers, but for the banks it's pretty bad. So to keep their profits up, they've got to walk off the edge and go into the esoteric financial trading that Steve was talking about. Whereas in Canada and Australia, they just don't face that same incentive. They're making perfectly good profits. Their share prices are remaining um, very high just from doing the things the banks have always done. And they go back to around 2005, 2006, you know, there's open derision about what's happening in Australia and Canada at that time. You know, they're seen as incredibly old fashioned, stuck in the mud, ripe for revolution banking. Certainly when spent some time in, in America and Canada, you know, the American bankers are openly contemptuous of what's going on in Canada. They just see it as a sleepy backwater. And we know how this story pans out because, as Steve says, Australia, UK and the US, actually the banks are taking huge amounts of risk without them knowing it, and Australia and Canada are the ones who come through relatively unscathed. Well, so then it seems that we know that excessive levels of competition in banking is a dangerous scenario to find yourself in. But then even within the US and the UK, with those structural constraints, some banks manage to stay away from the danger. So we have to think of the banks as having some agency and some of them using it well and some of them using it poorly. How, how might we come to terms with that fact? Um, this is where we come back to um, bankers' ideas. And as you said, agency is really important. So you've got to imagine bankers and banks in an institutional context that broadly drives them down the path we've talked about. But in a couple of examples, in the States, for example, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and in the end, Goldman Sachs all survived the crisis and got out of the trading or didn't enter the trading in the nick of time. And essentially, that was um, the bank's leadership saying, we don't like the look of these markets, we don't like the leverage going on, and we're not sure about these assets that are suddenly dominating the markets. Um, in the case of, say, Goldman Sachs, they pulled out of these particular markets heavily in December 2006 after looking at a run of data for the last couple of weeks on the decline in mortgage-backed asset values and said, right, we're out of here, and started selling heavily. And through 2006, started betting against the market and made a lot of money doing that. 
JP Morgan were cautious by 2005-06. Wells Fargo, a big traditional lender from San Francisco, never got into the market very heavily at all and stayed as a traditional banker. Now, the story of the book is that that's, that's institutionally difficult because there's a lot of um, short-term market pressure to join the herd and to amp up the uh, return on, on assets and profits, etc. These banks, particularly JP Morgan and Wells Fargo, for example, were making um, not very good returns, were being hammered by the markets, um, and possibly, we don't know this, but possibly survived because the crisis happened when it did. If the crisis had been postponed by a couple of more years, it wasn't uncommon for underperforming boards and CEOs in particular to get replaced by people who are going to be more energetic in the market and following the herd essentially. So it's an interesting story about agency in a pretty tight institutional context. There's a little bit of lesson learning that's going on as well. So some of the banks that um, uh, are the safest, certainly in Australia, you know, they ha they've had previous incidents where they've come close to difficulty. So the standout example there is Westpac, which in 2008, 2009, along with the Commonwealth Bank, is about as safe as it gets. Indeed, it starts launching advertising campaigns around that time, proclaiming to the world just how boring it is. Westpac's got an interesting institutional story, because if you go back to the early 2000s, it's a bank that found itself in real problems. It lent way too much on the property markets, took a series of hits, and there was a period in which its future viability was actively being questioned. Now, the result of that was something of a revolution in Westpac. New cohort of bankers come in, the people on the investment banking side who'd been taking the risks exit the bank and slowly, bit by bit, Westpac rebuilds itself and it rebuilds itself as a safe bank, deliberately adopting a low risk strategy. Australian banks are all pretty safe. I guess the one that kind of dips its toe furthest into the American markets and takes a hit on buying assets that turn out to be worth very little is NAB. Um, and what's interesting there, I guess, is that whilst all of the Australian banks making healthy profits throughout the 2000s. There was a sense, I think, within NAB that they were being outgunned by both Westpac and by Commonwealth Bank. If there was a bank in Australia that felt itself under pressure to increase its profit returns and therefore perhaps, as we now know, to take more risks, it was NAB. So there's variation within countries, but Australia as a whole is just a remarkable standout story of a safe banking system. And one of the interesting questions about what's happened since the crisis is the degree to which that's recognised across the world and people are seeking to learn lessons from it. Mm. Well, so if we put the strands together so far, what's the takeaway lesson for reform? I mean, one argument that the book makes is that our regulators still have a poor understanding of the crisis, and as a result, they're moderate reforms are not only moderate but ill-directed. Why is it that our regulators aren't performing better? I think the regulators have, have realised that banks need a lot more capital and um, giving banks a much bigger capital buffer means that they can make losses and, and uh, face less risk of becoming insolvent and thus needing bailing out. So that, that's one big lesson that I think everyone agrees on. And um, the battle over bank capital levels has been intense with the banks fighting back the regulators, in particular the UK, for instance, pushing hard um, to up bank capital levels. That's been a big battle. But the analysis in our book, um, you know, the obvious question is from the core economies, if they look around, they could say, well, why didn't the Canadian banks and the Australian banks go down? What was special about those, those situations? Our argument is that it's, it's market structures and levels of competition that matter a great deal. Um, for some reason, which we still don't fully understand, that message hasn't seemed to have sunk into global regulatory debates. The Australian-Canadian kind of experience seems peripheral compared to the core economies in the minds of core regulators, it seems. Uh, and, the, and the message, certainly from our book, and we hope it does get picked up, um, is that, um, as I said, market structures and competition matter a great deal. That's, that's a core area for reform if you want to make banking safer and much more kind of vanilla in style. It's a pretty tough sell, though, because the problem is that competition is actually pretty good for consumers in the short term. So the more banks are forced to compete with each other, the more that they're going to be forced to reduce their interest rates that they charge on loans and to increase the interest that they pay on deposits. That's the logic of competition. That's the invisible hand. And in large numbers of large areas of the economy, competition works pretty well. But in banking, it's just got this downside. So competition in the short term can bring these huge benefits to consumers, but at a cost of encouraging the banks in the longer term 
to take more and more risks, or at least to shift more of their activity away from lending and towards trading. And eventually consumers who benefit from better deals in the short term end up paying for it as taxpayers in the longer term. So when the banking system fails, they're the ones who end up having to bail it out. So there's a real difficult trade-off off there. So one of the things that we're doing in some of the work that we're doing at the moment is to try and look at how that message about competition can be solved and how you can ensure in relatively uncompetitive markets that consumers aren't left facing a really bad deal. Just, just to clarify slightly, uh, just one more point that we haven't really rammed home enough, I don't think, is that it's not just competition in banking markets, it's actually the competition in the market for corporate control. So that this, the key feature of Australia and Canada's experience is that if you're a CEO of one of the major banks, the regulations state, essentially, um, that you can't be taken over. So it's the market for corporate control. So banks can compete fiercely with each other on lending rates and services to customers and ha you can have as much competition in normal lending markets as you like. Our argument is that if, if competition for corporate control, i.e. corporate takeovers, becomes fierce, banks will go out of their way to raise profits to stay you know, viable in the market, etc. It's that sort of competition that's the problem. And it's that sort of competition that the Canadian and Australian legislation prevents, essentially. So it's happenstance. This, this legislation is now you know, a decade or more old. It wasn't invented to, to deal with the 2007 crisis, which no one had even thought of. It was there for another reason, i.e. consumers in Australia, for instance, don't like banks that much, and they don't like banks taking each other over and creating less and less you know, competition. They like the big four in Canada, the big five, and that's the way it's starting as far as governments are concerned at the moment. And, and it's had this knock-on effect of preventing calamities in the banking sector. So still the lucky country? Still the lucky country, by, by accident. Well, Stephen and Andrew, <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you. And if you're interested in the book, please visit the school's website and there's a link where you can order a copy.